Welcome back to another edition of the Friday Show brought to you by Woodbine Racetrack. We post on Friday, 4.45 p.m. post for an eight-race card. We take on Friday's card, and then the weekend post times at 12.55. I'm Ray Pollock, joined today by news editor Chelsea Hackbarth, and we've got Sal Sinatra, who in June became president of Equibase, based in Lexington. Equibase is the official data company and has been a little bit in the news since the Breeders' Cup because of some timing issues that uh, are involved in, in the charting of races and the posting of fractional times. Uh, welcome to the Friday Show, Sal. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate the time. Well, let's jump right into it. The, the, the timing of races for a long time has been done in a traditional fashion using a, a beam that goes across the track and when a horse the first horse in the race hits the beam that sets off the fractions for for the appropriate post in recent times the, there's been some technological advancements with gps technology first with Tracus, and now a company called or a, a product called gps i guess which is or uh, gmax which is part of a british company uh is doing some timing can you first just sort of take us through what happened at the Breeders' Cup with the timing of some races that were later changed? Um, okay. Basically, what's happened is the, the, the GMAX GPS system, which I actually tested at Laurel prior to coming here, we realized at the time uh, isn't as accurate. Within, it is within a you know, fifth or a tenth of a second, which isn't good enough for us. So we went and tried to revert back to the beams. Some tracks like Laurel is already wired for the beams, not an issue for the third course. Uh, Delmar was not. So we had to put together what we call a hybrid system. And that's just taking the beams, put uh, an antenna on them, making them talk to the GMAX. So we know where the start is and finishes and such. The problem is prior to doing that, we have to survey the track and find out where the beams are supposed to be as if they were drilled into the ground. So which we do, we supply it to the track and then they have somebody come in and actually put posts in so we can set the beams on them. At the end of the actual Delmar meet, the prior one, we probably finished up maybe a week or so before the meet had ended and everything was going just charming. Boom, everything on, boom, bang, bang. So we went into to Delmar Breeders' Cup I'm pretty confident, uh, hoping that most of the stuff we would have to do is the uh, extra stuff for NBC and the Breeders' Cup broadcast. Lo and behold, uh, the five eights on the turf, the first one, we had an issue. Don't understand why. We ran a five eights on the third or the turf uh, with zero setting at the end of the Delmar meet, and it was fine. Second five eights on the turf, also an issue. We, they were actually timed. Uh, faster than they should have been. Hmm. So we called up to uh, the, uh, TPD, who's our partner, uh, Total uh, Thoroughbred uh, Performance Data, who also subcontracts with us for GMAX to try and find out, because that's who we actually sent the survey to. So they called the survey company, they try and lay, and they told my guys on the ground, do us a favor and walk 87, or check 87 feet from the mile a half mile or wherever pole. So my guys went on the inside of the track, 87 to, to the T. They went on the outside of the track and they could see it's not 87 feet. Hmm. What had actually happened is when the poles were set, normally they're perpendicular to the, the actual rail across. This one's on a turn. And they instead of installing it perpendicular to the rail, they installed it as though it was going to be parallel with the gate setting, which it is 14 and a half feet difference on the outside. Mm. Now, the reason we didn't see this problem at the end of the Delmar meet was the inside horse or horses broke quickest that weekend, so they hit the normal spot. But both Breeders' Cup sprint turf races, the outside horses got out of the gate fast and broke the beam first. And therefore, the 14 and a half feet started the fractions, I guess, uh, quicker and then it was just a, a domino effect from there we fixed it for sunday's races there was a five eight on the surf that day that was fine so that was problem one uh the, the juvenile turf the philly juvenile turf the eighth race on friday 
we had uh, an issue that does happen with beams, and one of the beams was broken prior to the start of the race. Uh, it does happen with the beams normally, but the problem is we have our GPS as a backup, and the software for the GPS says, well, I don't see a beam, I'm the legitimate time. So that time, as I said, is always off, not always, but can be off by a fifth or, a t or tenths of a second, and that one actually recorded the race too slow went back and I understand I've been working with all these number of guys even since I was at Laurel they've been great help to me because they're all back checking us are you talking about you're talking about like the buyer speed figure buyer guys the thoroughgraph guys mm -hmm. been, they, they understand what we're trying to do I mean what we're trying to do is capture new data uh, for me being new here at Equibase one of my tasks is to, to try and develop new algorithms new data set for maybe people that aren't familiar with a past performance line you know, I'm looking at sports betters. Um, you know, most sports, baseball, football, a lot of algorithms, a lot of numbers. They understand feet. They understand miles per hour. They don't understand furlongs and lengths. And, mm. You know, fifths of a second instead of white. You know, you know, we're a little bit. I want to say, you know, a little closed circuit. But now, you know, with sports wagering out there, we have to be competitive. And uh, I think a new data set has been something that's been long uh, overdue. But these little glitches, as I say, we keep fixing them. I'm not going to, you know, like I told my guys, when we set the uh, beams after the survey, we need to go back and check and make sure that we're, they're in the correct spot. You know, we're trying to put uh, antennas on gates to try and get us a correct warm-up time. Uh, there's a lot of issues that none of us really even speak of because, you know, track may tell us it's 40 feet, the warm-up from the gate to the first beam, and they never set the gate in the same spot particularly on the turf, they don't want to ruin it. I mean, if you've seen Gulfstream and you see the different lines, just trying to save the turf because there's, you know, 20 tons running across it. So we're going to try giving it uh, and a more accurate, and at least we can give a time from the gate to the first beam, which right now is, for most practical purposes, is being done with a generic algorithm, and then they divide it amongst the, the fractions. This will make them uh, make things a little more exact. Hopefully, or at least closer to exact. That's what we're hoping to do. Why? Why wasn't? Why weren't the beams, you know, double and triple checked before Breeders' Cup at Del Mar? I mean, it, the fourteen and a half feet. I mean, it was easy to see as soon as you walked it, right? Uh, yeah, it well, was the outside. Yes, and like I said, we had run those distances or that distance the closing weekend at Del Mar meet. Dumb luck. That was all. I mean, we were generally. This whole hybrid system is a new thing since I came here. Basically, we started testing that at Laurel right before I left. So we're learning little things like the survey, like what happened at Belmont. Belmont, we had some issues with when they moved the temporary rail. The track crew moves that. They also have to move these beams because the distances change. So now you're back checking those guys. Um, you know, we had a new operator there who didn't know to check. You know, and it became, we had some problems there. And, you know, again, we have to figure that out. We're checking now. We have back checks with the stewards up there. We're, everybody's working together to get this correct. And like I said, uh, it seems like I'm making excuse after excuse, but because it's new technology, strange things keep happening. And hopefully, so, I think we got wrong. <laughs> so, so, Sal, if, if I'm understanding it, there are some tracks that are using the old system by, entirely there's some tracks that are using gps only gmax unfortunately yeah but prior to me getting here there were tracks okay. uh like penn national and mahoney valley two examples that i have to get the uh hybrid in tampa uh my guys are down there this week to make sure they set the hybrid and get the poles set up you know we're, we're playing catch up now because we understand the issue with the, the gmax uh the gps not being precise enough and, and now it's a learning curve because I have to get track personnel pretty much to move those beams at the start, usually somebody on the gate or, or another person. Yeah. So it's fortunately, most of the tracks are our partner and they understand the value of the data. Um, some of this data is being used overseas right now for in race wagering. You know, I'm hopeful sometime later this year to be able to present a data string to some of the companies that buy data from us and, start playing with it with graphs or numbers and see what see what we can come up with see if we can come up with something really 
new and and enticing to the sports player. So, so one last question on the on the the current system or the hybrid system rather is it are are the fractions record um, done with a beam or is it just the the, the final time of the race? Uh, the final time, the first, the uh, final time is the only thing that's absolutely beam. Okay. Uh, we we have the issue with the run up to the first beam for trips to start for the race, and then the fractions are being. Uh, analytically, I don't have the actual um, formula that they're using, but mm -hmm. generally what happens is you take the run up and there's a uh, generic, I want to say 0 0.025 per 10 feet. Mm -hmm. They add that to the time to start to finish and then they divide it amongst the fractions. Right. Um, not Again, not precise, we're fairly close. I think one of the questions we had because we were kicking it was the, the Crosby on the um, Saturday or Sunday at Delmar. The fractions were extremely fast, first quarter, half, and I think they came home in 26. And it looked really odd. But fortunately, all of our back checkers and everything, you know, they happen to be running. I mean, sometimes that does happen, but I'm actually glad we have everybody in the industry is actually trying to help us. You know, it gives a little frustrating. And like I said, um, one of the things is that we're working with companies from another country. They do things differently in other countries, such as the time. Uh, the time isn't actually official overseas until the following day. They don't seem the same necessary to have it as quickly as we're used to have. So, yeah, you know, there's a learning curve. Um, of course, that ran for you know, non wagering for purse money only. That, if I don't know if you noticed, but the horse had odds during the running of the race right. at Tom Hart. Their software has to see odds in order to show the, the checklet. If it doesn't see odds, it thinks the horse is scratching and wouldn't have seen it at all. So they have to fix that. And, mm -hmm. then, and these, these are little glitches when you try and move technology um, that are going to come up. And like I said, each hurdle we hopefully overcome. And I'm hoping Gulfstream right now is our big project with the third turf course, uh, the Tapita. We're waiting for the rail to get put in there. So between Gulfstream, and Tampa going hybrid, hopefully you start seeing uh, major changes and a little more precise yeah. timing. Sal, I'm interested in in the the technology of the of the GMAX. Why doesn't it provide specifically accurate times? You know, in real time. I mean, I, my GPS in my car works in real time. Uh, well, in real time is that get you precisely to where you want to be. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's precise to within, I want to say, one meter left and right. So what these guys have done, like for our company, we have a, a few antennas, and they call it triangulation. So we have two transponders in the horse in case one fails, plus you're basically using mathematical equations of a triangle to try and precisely find on the track where the horse is at. So that's how they're trying to overcome the one meter left and right, but they're still going to be awful. And the, the two biggest complications, I think, if I'm hearing you correctly, are the run up is 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 different and that what they say they're gonna do and what they do sometimes is different. And then when the temporary rails go up and you know in and out, did does that change things for, for the GMAC system as well as the it does. And that's why our, it's very important we do the survey. Uh and the survey is correct. You know, we used to do uh, temporary rails and it was about about distances. Nobody wants to see about distances now. So mm. it's, a, it's a question of doing that. And, and I feel bad because even at, when I was at Laurel, sometimes the guy, we have, you know, there's holes in the turf course to put the rail into. But you can start getting late in the year, especially as the turf sprints, where you want to cheat a little bit on the turns because they're getting chewed up. But, you know, you move that rail an extra foot or a yard, it's going to change the dimensions of the race mm. and the actual distance. And, you know, because you're talking a big area. Um, and you gotta can't really do that. So you know, we're, it, I guess it's because it, it's not dynamic. It's pretty much you know, if you tell them it's gonna be a ten foot move and a twenty foot move, mm. that's what we survey, and that's kind of where that's why we need um, the hybrid basically is for a turf course because that five eighths or you know moves with the rail, um, and that's a big problem. It's, well, I know that uh, I know that you come by your knowledge of this stuff fairly honestly because when i worked at the racing forum in the 1980s 
there was a woman named Marie Sinatra who worked out of the Heights Town, New Jersey office, who was, I think, statistical supervisor or editor. And uh, so you, you've been, you, you understand the importance of the data to the horse player. Yes, I do. And uh, that, that brings back memories. I mean, I was, she was actually my boss for a few years through high school and college as well. Oh, but, boy, uh, yeah. that must have been fun, huh? And I like to play. I mean, I, I, I kid you not, I enjoy, enjoy the sport and try to figure it out just like everybody else. I do use buyer or third graph numbers when they're available to me. I want them to be good. Yeah. You know, and you know, go back to when I was at Laurel. One thing about bad times is not only the guys handicapping, I would get horseman complaints. The track's too fast. Mm. Then I got my track superintendent doing things that he shouldn't be doing, which that is probably fine. There's a big domino effect in this data. The, more, the better we can make it, the better it is for everyone. Yeah. So it's a work in progress, it's fair to say. It is. And we're tightening the screws and, and, and getting our procedures down. And, I, and I'm hopeful that as we come out of this year, we have proper procedures we've got all our traps to hybrid that aren't hybrid and we can move forward from there well sal in your in your um your previous life you were with the maryland jockey club i'm i'm sort of interested in in whether you would have handled the uh non-wagering incident on friday any differently than it was handled at del mar dangerous question i know but it is and then unfortunately i think what happens is when you make these rules, the toad has to make the software work that way. So I think when the rules are made, <clears throat> whether it's commission, commission combination, we really need to sit back and say, okay, are we doing the fair thing? Hmm. Is this, okay, we understand. I personally don't like horses running for first money only because then they can cause a foul. Now you have another problem in the race. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I understand you want the person who the mistake was made, allow them to run. Um, I had a couple of horses actually uh, at parks. We scratched the wrong horse in the paddock. I didn't let the horse, other horses run. I scratched them both. Only, because, but it's a different, you know, maiden ten is a little different than a Breeders' Cup race, you know. And I make it up to the trainer and we try and write a race and get it back. But mm. it, especially the, the uh, horizontal rate pagers, you know, right. guys have a live ticket and something like that happens. Especially when two of them, the favorite, you know, two favorites scratch. Now you're down to the third choice, and you probably tossed. It's just not a good thing. Well, Sal, we appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, it's great to see someone in charge of Equibase who, you know, is a, is a, is a horse player himself who's, you know, who's been around the game, who understands the importance of the data. And I kind of look, I'm kind of excited about where the, uh, you know, where all this data from the GPS technologies will, will take the industry. Uh, let's keep in touch and hopefully later this year I can come on and we can do this again. Okay. Thanks so much, Sal. And uh, we'll be right back after taking a look at this week's Woodbine Star of the Week. Secret agent in front by a half a length to Lady Spite Spear. And down the outside, all glutes and Lady Spite Spears hit the front. And off she goes. Lady Spite Spear by a couple of lengths. Our secret agent in second. And she's handling the main track just fine. And Lady Spitespear has the best Arabian well in her keeping. And she remains undefeated. Lady Spitespear, a charming winner by four and a half lengths to our secret agent. Lali Well, now she's four for four, Lady Spite Spear winning uh, at Woodbine. She's, she was two for two as a two-year-old, including a win in the Natalma. Um, this is a Chuck Fipke homebred by Spitestown out of Lady Shakespeare, who herself was a uh, graded stakes winner, multiple graded stakes winner, who is out of Lady Sherl, who was uh, another multiple graded stakes winner. So you've got graded stakes winners, uh, to the first three generations of this female family, which is tremendous for Chuck Fipke, who really breeds a good horse, Chelsea. Well, and, and Roger Atfield deserves a huge shout out here too, because this filly was scratched at Keeneland on uh, out of the QE2 when she acted up at the gate and uh, they figured it out and they put one of those fancy gate blankets on her for this race and boom, straight to the, straight to the winner's circle. 
Well, she's three for three, for three on turf and now on the uh, synthetic as well. So light, Lady Spite Spear, hard to say, but uh, fun Philly to watch race. That is going to do it for this week's edition of the Friday Show. Special thanks to Sal Sinatra, president of Equibase, for joining us to talk a little bit about Equibase's uh, charting and timing systems, uh, a work in progress, as he admitted. Uh, thank you, Chelsea, for joining us. And we will be back next week with a special Thanksgiving edition of the Friday Show.